Recording is on. There you go. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm really kind of ex I'm excited to chat about Mastodon. Um, we've been uh, kind of experimenting a lot with it at Reclaim in various ways um, in terms of hosting it and how to make it easier to use, or easier to host, I should say, um, and sort of the capabilities of it, um, as well as obviously there's a lot of interest. <laughs> around the internet about about Mastodon and Fediverse related um, tools generally. Um, I'm particularly interested, and it's not something I know a lot about yet, um, like intimately, but I'm really interested in kind of learning more about ActivityPub, like the, the, the core sort of standard um, that uh, makes federated services like Mastodon and um, PixelFed we were talking about uh, work. Um, because I think there's a lot of promise there, but it's been something that I've been kind of digging into and trying to learn what makes it tick. And I'm still kind of doing that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really, really interested to kind of dig into that. Um, I, I don't really want to talk a lot of, in this community chat about Twitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't really think anyone does. Right. Um, but um, there's a lot, lot to be, um, a lot has been said and stuff on there, but I'm really um, personally really excited to see kind of how the the communities, these small communities that have been growing and, and seeing for me, the Fediverse become an actual real thing in the last couple months. I've been aware of Mastodon and tools like it, but I've never really dove in myself because that's not where the people I was interested in following were, and that has definitely changed for me. So um, the last couple months, that's really cool. Um, but um, yeah, I, 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 you know, Mastodon, it, it's only been around since like 2016 as an open source project, as far as I'm aware. Um, and the, the activity pub standard that it uses um, is, I've been doing a little bit of research. From my understanding, it's not even a, a, an official W3C standard. It's a proposal, but um, is pretty well understood to be like a stable proposal. Like it's not necessarily uh, doing breaking changes. So there's a lot of things that implement it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm interested in following that space, but I, I think we're still kind of waiting on a... Like, I, I think you can look at RSS and when something says it uses RSS, you have a reasonable expectation of what it does. And I don't think I'm there yet with ActivityPub because I, I, there's a lot of tools that say, yeah, we use ActivityPub and can post things. But then it, when rubber comes to road of like, well, what does that mean? What does it look like um, is where I'm still kind of figuring out and experimenting. Um, but um, yeah, I'm really kind of curious, anyone here in the call, you know, uh, what their experiences with using Mastodon, how long they've been using it, um, what they've been um, seeing, like what their experience has been with it so far. Um, and maybe you've been using it for a long time, but, or, or a couple of weeks, so. I can jump in and say that I am a brand new beginner, so I'm still trying to make sense of it, honestly, and understanding you know, like I, I think I accidentally created two accounts at once or within a span of a couple of days because I didn't realize that my single account could be applied to multiple hosts or versions or, you know, instances. You can, I'm really kind of showing how little I know about it, but it's been fun to play around and just, um, it's hard for me to not talk about Twitter just in terms of comparing it, but I'll try to um, not well, jump too much into that. But I, I should specify, I don't want to talk about Elon Musk. <laughs> that's that's what I mean. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so it has been interesting because uh, I am just sort of naturally comparing it. Uh, and I know that Reclaim has thought about making the move or I think Reclaim Hosting does have an account in Mastodon now and we're trying to just think about how we're going to be communicating in both spaces. But um, yeah, I'd be curious to know how others are using it or, you know, if someone wants to share their screen and walk through it, you know, I'm, that's why I'm here is just getting a sense of how others are thinking about it because it's brand new for me. One of the things that you 
touched on, and I think this is just sort of the biggest challenge for Mastodon is like coming to grips with instances and and your accounts on them and what what that means and what you. I think a lot of people who who have like at least poked around in Mastodon understand that like hey there are instances and they can talk to each other like once you dig in you you find that out pretty quick that you you can follow folks on other instances and things like that but um but that's not necessarily given I will say um plenty of, I I I'm really maybe talking more like folks maybe in this circle who are um who are showing up to a reclaim hosting community chat are probably in many cases likely aware of that once they've looked into it. Um, but I have been interested to see um, the, the two things. So so I've been kind of intentionally talking about Mastodon with friends of mine who aren't really into tech at all. Um, and s the awareness of that is like all over, all over the place. Um, some people have never heard of it. Some people have. Um, most people don't know what I just said about the following folks between different instances, the federated part. That's a really kind of hard thing to get your, your head around. Um, and then the, the second thing, which is like, yeah, how do I manage accounts? That was my big question going into it is I understood the following thing, but I was like, well, people say you can pick whatever instance, but what happens when I have to move because my instance is going away or... I don't like the decisions that they're making or something, you know, whatever, whatever reason. Um, like that's empowering that I, that these small communities can, can form, but what is my, um, uh, what can I do about it as just a user on an instance and seeing that Mastodon has a pretty simple like export, you can go into your profile say I want to export my stuff and move it over to another instance and then you can just import it over there. That was great. But I think the thing I really didn't understand was the redirect. So you can you can actually say I'm now over here and when folks visit your Mastodon account at the old server, it will say, hey, they're actually on this server now. But way more cool than that, it will also redirect folks um, who are following you so that it should just follow right over. And that's something I've only played with a little bit. Like I, I, I did it uh, on one occasion. I'm going to probably do it again here at some point. Um, right now I'm on the DS106 server that Jim's been um, maintaining. But I think I'm going to try just so I can stay familiar with it to do my own just one personal uh, Mastodon. Um, although I, I'll say I think I'm going to miss the local timeline because I like that feature where you can see everyone on the server, especially on a small server like DS106. I think that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I, it'll be good for me to remain familiar with it. Um, but seeing that implementation and that redirect thing just working is interesting, but I think scary. Like if you haven't done it before, and even if you're listening now and being like, I understand what he's saying, but like, does it actually work that way? Um, you know? That's kind of scary, um, and that's that's I think a big problem. Um, and and if even taking a step back, it's a big problem to even understand all of that capability. That's just I I had someone who a friend of mine who is who works as a UX designer um, for a, a pretty large like web development company who. Uh, was like, yeah, I've heard about web uh, Mastodon, but I don't really know what it's about. And I explained it, and they're like, that's a UX nightmare. They should fix that. And I was like, well, I don't know that fix, like, what does fix it mean, right? Like, because that's inherent. Taylor, I tried like to describe that Mastodon like email. Yeah. Right? Sure. Like, yes, it, you can get edbeck at gmail.com. You could also get edbeck at yahoo.com. So the beginning and the end are both important yeah. to your handle it's tricky though because the, the the difference i think that i mean that that from like a perspective of how that works i think that's a good metaphor but where that breaks down is people go yeah but like when i get a new email address it's because i don't want people <laughs> emailing me at my old one and it's showing up there in some cases obviously you can forward email and people do that but i think that's the that's the tricky thing. Um, and it, it mostly does work that way, right? You set up a forward in email, you'd set up a redirect in, in Macedon. Um, 
but um, I think that is so far. I think the difference is most people don't actually care that much about their email address, and some people do care about their social profiles. Um, Hi, I'm Jim Groom, and I have a Mastodon problem. <laughs> I've been on Mastodon for one month and change, and I now have three servers set up. Um, and so I'll show you quickly what that looks like. I didn't want to interrupt you, Lauren, though. Oh, no, it's fine. Um, and maybe, again, I just need to play around with it more, but I think... And I, I like how you're addressing it. I, that I've tried to take a similar approach to with, you know, thinking about it like email addresses. I sometimes wonder though, given this is a, a social platform or a space where you're supposed to be connecting and finding others in the community, I I worry that it's it's harder to find people in Mastodon because yeah. both the beginning and the end is different. And when I'm like if I'm in reclaim.rocks right now, and that's where I have my account, if I s use the search bar there and I go to search, you know, for users, I'm only, is it true that I'm only searching for people who are also hosted in reclaim.rocks or does it, is it a larger search bar for anyone with a Mastodon account? Because it will search beyond that, that instance. If you, you have the domain in there too. So that's the difference. So though. I have to know it though, right? And I guess yes. that is where it is similar to email. It's like, if you know it, you're in luck. If you don't know it, you can't really find it in the same way. Yeah. So if you were to go to reclaim.rocks and put in like Taylor Jaden, just that, just Taylor Jaden, yeah. no ads, nothing. Um, it may actually find me because it's possible that one of the, the thing is it's going to be looking for profiles it already knows about. And then if you have the at and the domain name on there, then it will find anyone, right? Because it knows that's where not, to go. That's not true, Taylor. Or at least it's not true on my Mastodon. And it's no, possible, mine either. It's possible that there are differences based on upgrades and based on choices that the individuals mm -hmm. have made. So if I just search for the name Lauren, for example, from my Mastodon, and I chose to be on the IndieWeb Mastodon, I see my first four reactions. One is from Mastodon.social. One is from mastodon.laurenweinstein.org. One of them is from journa.host. So I'm going across the Fediverse right now. I'm looking at Yeah, but those are accounts it already knows about, right? And by knows about, I'm not being real clear, but like it, it's not going to find any Mastodon server anywhere with Lauren in the name like Twitter. Like it would be possible to just type Lauren into Twitter and find literally every Twitter user with Lauren in their handle. That's, but it's not it's not limited to the server. It's it's not just to limited to accounts on the server, but like those are probably of people who are connected are, to that server in some way. Yes. And I don't personally I don't know enough to say, oh, they have to be followed or it has to be because there's if you dig in this stuff, it gets a little bit complicated because there are things that Mastodon will do where it'll say, Hey, I know about this server out there, and it can do some searching there. But um yeah, it knows about is where I that's the end of my knowledge there. I don't know what knows about exactly means, but yes, the search isn't just local to the server. It's a little bit beyond that, but if you but there are times like, you know, uh like if you type um like uh, even a popular account or something into your local Mastodon instance and search and you don't have the entire handle, it may not find it. Um, so that handle includes the domain name. One of the things I'm finding with it, so this is, so talking about my Mastodon problem, well, thank you for coming here. I'm, there'll be coffee and donuts after, these, <laughs> after, after this session. But this is, um, this is an account I made on DS106's Mastodon, which is social.ds106.us. And as you were alluding to earlier, there's this local feed of all the people that are on this server. So that's local to this server. And then there's the federated feed, which kind of brings in people that aren't, I'm not necessarily following, but maybe other people on the server are following or just maybe people are streaming in. But these are people that I, by some connection, can see and then follow and discover. I don't think so, Jim. I think that's trying to download the entire 
That's like just scrolling. What is the most recent post on Mastodon? I Not think every Mastodon be, server. That though. couldn't be though, because yeah. that would be way too much. It, it's through. it's the federated timeline. Timeline again. It's like what your server knows about, right? So, um, it's going at people. So anyone on DS one hundred six who is following someone on any account on any other server, that's what's in the federated timeline. If if you looked that at every sense. single uh thing published to mastodon across every single mastodon server if you had a way to do that it would be a, a lot more populated in the federated timeline like so i i just did it and i'm i have slow scrolling on um so that new items don't just automatically push it down and in about the 10 seconds that i've been on there 80 new items have been posted i think yes yeah, so that's not that many though right i think the difference <laughs> um, is that you're on the indie web Mastodon it's a much more server, federated which server. Which has got probably hundreds, if not thousands of people. And so you're getting, by being on that server, the connection of hundreds of thousands of exponentially connected. So it does make sense that you would see a lot more than yeah. I would on DS106. And if you did that, if you had an account on Mastodon.social, right, run by the maintainers of Mastodon, doesn't take signups, but it's probably one of the largest ones your federated timeline there is probably useless in terms of how it's because so many so many things are coming through it i think even um, on a mid-sized server your federated timeline is useless fair enough yeah and um, even and i'm sorry go ahead i was just gonna say i'm still trying to wrap my head around the searching finding people um and crossing over so the idea being that for example, if Ed follows Jim, who's on a different server, then... I blocked Ed. Okay. <laughs> uh, even, even so, but hypothetically, if Ed follows Jim, who's on a different server, then people who Jim follows, regardless of server, you can search for those, you can search and see those people. Well, the, the cleaner thing to think about it is that a person's username on Mastodon includes the server that they're at too, right? So when you're looking for someone, you need, there should be two at symbols, although you can you can leave one out and sometimes we'll figure out what you mean. But like my Mastodon username is taylorjaden at social.ds106.us. You could go to um, a different server and register Taylor Jaden there, but that's not me, right? Um, that's someone else. And I understand um, that part, but my, my, my thinking is who does end up being pop populated. And that's searching. Well, but, but my point is if you put the domain name, it'll find them regardless of what server they're on. It does not matter at that point. Sure. The, but the, if you don't the, put it's the, the fuzzy name. searches where you don't have a complete username, that's where you may not find them. And it depends on how many how large your server is how many like that that's just unclear and that's where like the search features of twitter are pretty powerful and Mastodon, in terms of that that aspect of search is a little bit trickier you you kind of need their whole handle to be guaranteed to find someone sure okay. i'm just trying to figure out who ends up in the pool of i think what we're saying of, is we don't really know okay <laughs> Correct. hypothesis i have but theories but i don't actually know Okay. I feel like it's based on your followers, sort of like common, similar to how Facebook will recommend people to you based on who you're friends with and who they're friends with, sort of like a web or network. I'm wondering if it does something similar to that. Because um, Jim, while you were sharing your screen and you typed my name in, um, just Lauren, like if I search Lauren in my search bar, I have a very similar list that comes up. And I'm wondering if it's just because you and I follow each other and maybe follow similar people. But yeah. again, that's my very beginner theory. My, I think this is that's also... pretty close. I think that's, that's my working theory too, basically, except that it also can include other folks on your server and who they follow. Yeah, so if I didn't follow Lauren, but we're on the same server, then Lauren's pool would still include people that I follow. That's my theory. Okay, that's interesting to me. I put this in the chat. The thing that I really like about Mastodon uh, and that I really hated about Twitter was 
the fact that I really like the ability to say, you do not get to see the list or the number of people that follow me and who I follow. Um, I just cool. really didn't like that for privacy, for what it ended up doing of like, I have 20,000 followers, so I'm cooler than, yeah. I thought that was and stupid. But so if that... I turn that off, does that affect the pool or not? I don't, I don't think so. But you can do that regardless of whether your account is public or pro like the actual things you publish are public or private. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. I didn't yeah, that's know in, that. Uh, I wanna, just turned that off. Do you, does anyone want to see inside the profile, like some of the admin things you can do as an admin of a server? Like, not sure. that I'll take you through deeply, but like a couple of things that are cool is obviously you get notified and Downs is loving my Galaxian as everybody on Mastodon should love my Galaxian. But more than that, there's this edit profile, which actually as an admin, you really get to, to your point, um, Pilot, control stuff like automated post deletion. Remember the whole deleters on Twitter? There was a whole movement like, I'm deleting my tweets that are two weeks old because someone might read it and take it out of context. Well, that's built into Mastodon, as is the import export, as is something that we've been playing around with and is super cool. And let me find it. Oh, do I, I don't have it on DS1 on this account, but you can see it here on, um, which is, I think the coolest thing about Mastodon is web um, hooks that allow you to bring in other applications like Azuracast, the open source radio station. This is a web hook to let me know when someone goes on DS106 radio or reclaim radio right within the thing. And so like you have, Really, for me, the administration of different users, right? So you can see new users, active users, interactions, server settings. You get to see all of these are the kind of server pieces like the, the database and the sidekick piece. All of this is really a nice interface for administering and kind of managing a small server. And when I say small server, you can see there's 39 users and we have collected in the course of a month and change almost 30 gigs of data in terms of just media that have been collected as a result of those federated posts that come in with their images, with their video, with their collected stuff. It's super interesting to think about how to deal with the collection of all of those federated kind of um, details. But I really love the fact that you can hook into other applications. Ed, when you told me that you could actually in Mastodon follow my PeerTube instance, I was like, that is awesome. And you demonstrated that. And for me, that's when the light bulb went off. Like my PeerTube can come in here. And I like that I don't have any followers here and that I basically am talking to a few people and discovering them as I go. And it's not like you said, Pilot, about massive following and i'm gonna sit on this pulpit and tell everybody what i think and everybody's gonna bow down to me because that's what twitter became and it became boring mm -hmm. and i think this is actually exciting because there are people trying to figure it out like how do you crosscast between twitter and mastodon cleanly how do you bring your post how do you use wordpress as a as a place where you can do all of your distributed federated stuff like i think it's fun because it's a brave new world of sorts and mm. you have power in it i feel yeah i i like what you're saying jim and i appreciate you know kind of being off a you know like we're not um i don't know worshiping one voice over the other and that sort of idea in this space and i really like that but i think one of the things that i appreciated about twitter is i could I really could find and connect with others in this community. And like, for instance, like I'm on Catherine Cronin's account right now, we follow each other and she has 630 followers and I would love to see who those people are. And I'm not, I guess that's uh, maybe a user preference or maybe it's a Mastodon wide thing, but I can't see who she's following or who's following her. And before that used to be one of the ways that I would try to, find new 
you know, people to connect with and just see, you know, what the trends are around certain things. And so maybe I'm just thinking about the space wrong and it's not comparable to Twitter in that way. It's something else entirely. So I might just have to change the way that I'm thinking about it as it's it, interesting. It's a, a, not a replacement, but go ahead. here it is. Here's hide your social graph. So yeah. you have a choice to say, I don't want other people to be able to look at the followers kind of like pilot was saying for like yeah. different reasons, because Follower count became a Does source it still of show the power. Number? Um, um, it, it, it uh, if you go to mine, I just turned that setting on. So if I'll you go look. find mine, it'll show. It'll. Uh, it'll. I can, it still shows the number. Yeah. <laughs> I do think, though, I, I like that cast, users though. have a choice. I think that that's really cool. I guess I just, you know, I the the findability is something that I'm still struggling with. But I said that in the beginning. Anyway, someone else can. But it, it is it is I think a tricky thing because I will say, Lauren, like that's what I got the most value out of Twitter for too. Is it, it was pretty easy to find people, and in Mastodon, it's it's not as easy just by the definition of how it works and I don't want it to work in a more centralized way personally. So, you know, like it's, it's, it, it, it's just different. It's been a little bit hard for me to kind of come to terms with how that works for me and against me, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, not me personally, but you know, anyway. Um, but yeah, I will say you can, if that setting is not the social graph thing is not turned off, you can go, um, to a thing and click on the following and see who people are following. But it will say, um, depending on the, the account, it'll say, hey, you can only look at this if they're, and I can share my screen here. Um, it'll give you a, a little warning that says you have to visit their profile on the server that they are, um, uh, on the server that they are uh, hosted on like their their own instance. So if I go here and like find like let's try this account and I go to following, it's going to say follows from this server are not displayed. Browse more on the original uh, from other servers are not displayed. And then you can click that and it'll go to their profile on this person's on Mastodon dot social. And then I can click on it and there we go. So it's a little it's a little weird, um, but it it is possible to do. Um, I think, um, the, the, the activity pub stuff is really interesting to me too, but I, I, I've always heard people describe it as like, kind of like RSS, but for, um, the, you know, maybe a more flexible offers more different types of capability. And then the big one is it's bi-directional, right? You can not just read, but you can also use multiple things to post. Um, there's, there's all kinds of stuff that, that does this, um, and that's, I think, really interesting. But like I said, it's it's one of those things that I'm still kind of waiting to see, like what the conventions are going to be as these things get more popular. Like ActivityPub is not new, you know. Th there's there's been um, folks in the in in the indie web space and tools have been using that for a while. Um, but um, I think what is new or is starting to be new is sort of like th this. Mastodon and other Fediverse tools just getting more public interest all of a sudden. And I'm hoping that this results in a lot more clean integrations of ActivityPub between different things. I've, I've read that um, like uh, Matt Mullenweg from Automatic has said that Tumblr, they own Tumblr um, as, as well as uh, WordPress.com, um, that they want to put uh, ActivityPub into Tumblr, which is really interesting. Um, I read that and I was like, cool, they should put that right in WordPress. Um, that's, that's, I'd be like more, there are ways to do use activity pub and WordPress right now with plugins, but I would love to see like an official support, um, like, you know, like pingbacks, like are, are built. Yeah. In. And they, they, you know, um, automatic invested some significant money in that, um, already, like they posted out and, um, said, are there any teams from Twitter that just got laid off that we would that we could hire and hired some groups of people as a team to try to invest in that to see if they could capitalize on this moment? Who knows what that's going to lead to, but it seems like they're they're trying. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to see that the other thing I'm, 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 you know, I, I, I've been messing with the WordPress plugin. Um, and I know that was, that came up and I put it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's already getting buried a little bit, but I put in the chat, a article that I shared on Mastodon at about 1233. Um, and when I uploaded that and then shared an article that I'd written on my blog and people replied to my toot, it brought them in because it was activity pub in as comments, That's all cool. the, all the activity that happened on Mastodon came in as comments to my WordPress site because I had been playing with those things. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think that's really awesome. Um, I, I think, um, and, and like I said, like that's clearly, but that's, that, that's a lot of significant integration and work that, you know, of that plugin in this case to make that happen. And I'm just really interested to see like, if, Mastodon and, the, and tools like Mastodon and, and ActivityPub and Fediverse, if this stuff takes off enough, where else are we going to see this integrated in, in meaningful ways? It would be really interesting to see, um, you know, uh, like we mentioned PeerTube, but like, okay, what about PeerTube comments, you know, um, and, and, and all kinds of things like that, that can break out of the actual application that they're designing and do cross application stuff. So interesting but how do we make that a relatable and understandable thing for people to use, even if it does work? Um, it's it's uh, not trivial to explain these sort of weird and complicated concepts for people that haven't encountered them. So Ed is... or, I'm sorry, one second, Pilot. Ed or Tim or whoever, what plugin did you use to make the comments show up on your blog post? ActivityPub. Activity, one that just Tim, that one Tim just linked to? Okay. Yeah, the one that Tim just put in the... Yeah, thank you. I actually, related to that, is Activity Pub is the thing that it's doing making your blog its own separate Mastodon profile, or is it pulling kind of. your posts in as toots? It is, it's, it's my blog is now like a Mastodon endpoint. So Pilot, if you go into your Mastodon and mm -hmm. you search for Becky J yep. at edbeck.com, it will show up like it's a Mastodon account. It okay. will, you'll, you'll see my profile picture. It, mm -hmm. I had to do some kind of indie web stuff to make that work. I had to make sure that my, um, my photo was on the web page and I set up my H card properly so that it knew you know programmatically oh this picture is the, okay. the profile picture and so i had to do some some things to make that work but it looks like it's a mastodon account okay i'm just wondering if there's a way because it, it would probably be simple to do it with rss um provided i did a little bit of digging but the idea of in twitter i believe you could automate I've put out a blog post. It gets pulled in as a tweet uh, to my. Yeah, I think that already exists. I think yeah, pre I use an IFT T to do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm so not sure that that exists, but I'm wondering if it would, if there's a way to hook it up so that we've been talking about how replies in Mastodon then get brought in as comments, mm -hmm. and whether that would be specific to if I if I were to be pulling things in that way, whether that would bounce back or whether it's only bringing in my blog as its own separate. I think profile. it's related to the URL mm -hmm. pilot. For example, I was interacting as my Mastodon account and mm -hmm. I was just in this conversation with some New Zealand OER folks. And so I brought it up. I, I, I said, oh, I wrote a blog post about this a couple of years ago. Here's what I think. Um, and it wasn't from my like official like Becky J at edbeck.com user account. It was from my Mastodon user account. When they replied to it, it was linked to it enough that okay. comments came in. Um, I didn't have to do much. Cool. Yeah, and that's that's Activity Pub enabling that to happen. The interesting thing about that pilot is like 
the the um like you were saying like that people do badges. like automatic posting from twitter or from blog posts to twitter the thing is twitter is not doing that right twitter is just the place that it ends up they're using some software to do the cross posting right yeah. if iftt uh zapier um all there's all kinds of things right you need some middleware though maybe it's a wordpress plugin that's doing it directly Mm -hmm. um, but you need something to do that. And the kind of interesting thing about ActivityPub is in many cases, if both ends support it, you don't need that middle thing. Um, mm -hmm. so, so like in this instance, it's sort of Mastodon talking to the ActivityPub plugin. And I think it'd be even cooler if, if that was, if this got popular enough, if, if, uh, automatic saw it or the wordpress.org community saw it, that they wanted to build that in the WordPress and it was just part and there was no plugin needed um you know i don't know that we'd ever get there who knows right but that mm -hmm. i think could be kind of amazing for revitalizing like blog comments and, and things like that like for for folks that have aren't it doesn't haven't encountered that in the same way and, and to kind of tie these worlds together and do it in a way where it happens and you don't have to do much to make it happen would be so interesting yeah you know, and maybe it's just a, a button you turn on, right? And you can say like, allow blog comments. Oh, also allow comments from the Fediverse you mm -hmm. know, or, or something like that. Tim, have you been messing around with that activity pub plugin? No, I've, I've, um, I've just been trying to sort of learn the ropes and go slow, uh, with, uh, shutting down Twitter and, and, and bringing up Mastodon. So uh, it's on my list of things to, to think about. Um, I'm also just maybe taking a little bit of a break from these things and, and seeing how I miss the, the sort of personal learning network aspect of it. But a lot of things I think that are falling away right now are, are actually quite healthy for me. And I'm trying to determine how much of this I want to pursue and how much I want to just sort of close the book on it and, uh, and, and maybe not, if that makes any sense. I think that makes total sense. <laughs> I missed um, out on Twitter. When, I, when Twitter started, I was still teaching high school and that's where all the high schoolers were. So I actively avoided being on Twitter and then like, I remember like Lauren, when you came to Oneonta, you're like, Hey, can you like, give me your Twitter handle and I can tweet about coming to Oneonta. And I was like, you know, you could, I, I'll give it to you, but it'll just be embarrassing for both of us. You know, like. That's funny. <laughs> it's been set up since 2007. I have two tweets out. <laughs> yeah. No followers. I'm not following anyone. It's, it's kind of interesting. Like for, for me, um, I've never been huge into Twitter, but like it, I think Twitter was something I used a lot in college with friends. And then by the time I graduated college, then it eventually became my learning network. And so that was kind of weird. I had like two little um, uses for Twitter, um, but I've never been like, I've never been someone who tweets a lot. I'm mostly just reading and following things. Um, but um, for that, I, I feel, I feel more comfortable to be sort of myself on Mastodon, kind of like I did when early days for me on Twitter, just because it's smaller. And I, it's interesting. I see people saying like, oh, people just like Mastodon because it's smaller. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I don't really know if that's a problem. It's, it's not a problem for me. I can see some of the things that they're saying is like, okay, well, what about if it becomes big and there's moderation issues. And I, I get all of that. Like I, that those are things to think about, but I have to say, like, I, I really just kind of like that it's a smaller place and I'm more encouraged. Like I am a Mastodon completionist in terms of the follow. I, I don't follow that many people, but I, I often see everything that was like posted to Mastodon in a day of the people that I follow. That's really cool. I don't do that with Twitter and basically haven't since 2012, you know? Um, and I know I could have, that's my fault, right? I could just unfollowed a bunch of people on Twitter like, and then made that experience for myself, except with algorithmic stuff. I get like 
a bunch of garbage in there anyway, but you know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've seen, I, I, I anticipate two problems and they're kind of opposite of each other. Um, Twitter was really good at re-engaging people because it would choose something from an algorithm and say, hey, you haven't been on Twitter yet. You know, you haven't been on Twitter for a while. Check out this post that's gaining traction. You know, check out this person that has a lot of follows followers. So um, that must mean that what they say is important and come back and engage with that post. Um, Nesson isn't going to reach out and hit you and say, come back. Um, and I've seen a lot of educational communities die or atrophy when they aren't getting those re-engagement reminders. And those can either be kind of manual, hey, we're sending out a, uh, a, a, a monthly, you know, email, or they can be kind of, you know, created by an algorithm. Hey, this person that you've engaged with in the past is posted. Um, do you want to see that? You know, but Mastodon isn't going to do that. They're anti-algorithm. Mm -hmm. Then I also, the, uh, the flip side of that is I also see people who want to be on Mastodon because it aligns with their values of, of open, but they have benefited so much from the algorithms of Twitter that they can't really get themselves free of Twitter. Um, I'm thinking of someone in the open community. I won't say their name, but like they actually changed their name to blank is on Mastodon, but they keep going back to Twitter because they get so much more reach there and they get so many more likes and reposts there, but they don't get that same feeling from Mastodon. So it's like that drug they're always going back to. And it's like, oh, you really want to be, you really want to be into Mastodon, but you really love the algorithm that promotes your post and sends me an email when you post that you get from Twitter. Yeah, but in, in in some ways, that's a marketing tool for them, right? It's not really the same use case as me and you, right? Uh, and I I understand the challenge there, but I'm maybe not that sympathetic to it. <laughs> I'm kind of like, okay, that's not my problem, you know? Um, and not that I would say that um, uh, that that's, makes it not a problem for someone, but I'm just saying like, it's it's tricky and it's kind of related. Like there there um, there was an interesting uh, I saw some stuff on Mastodon of like okay what about like higher ed presences in the Fediverse and what is that going to look like or or will ever you know who knows and like could would would a college or university have an official account what would that look like would they host it themselves or pay for a host or would they join one of the like large instances like what why what 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 would they do and and i think you know there's a very real uh there's there's folks saying like well you know reach would be diff more difficult and you know yeah you it probably would be relevant constantly yeah i think you're not going to get promoted because you have a lot of followers i think the thing because, because twitter's algorithm if you had you know a hundred thousand alumni that followed your institutional account they would say ah this account must be important so when this account you know tweets something out i should you know buzz some people and let them know or promote that tweet higher in the algorithm the college and universities will not like mass value. yeah but but i think a lot of what made twitter what it what it is happened before they were doing a lot of that stuff right um now uh, I guess it depends on what you mean by what it is. But like, I think about like the, the you're talking about the re-engagement stuff. And like when I found Twitter most useful, it didn't do that, right? Like it, not at that time. Um, and I don't know what to think about that because on one level it's like, okay, maybe that's a good thing. On the other hand, it's like, maybe I'm beyond checking in on this, right? Like I've never been one to have Twitter open all day. So like the re-engagement stuff, definitely gets me into things more often but i personally don't actually want that you know um so it, it's it's complicated but there are people who will want that and there are of course also people who do have twitter or mastodon or whatever open all the time um and it's 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 complicated <laughs> um but i i do think um the the uh i'm, I'm really also it's super cool to see like like Jim, you're showing like the web hooks and how by the very nature of what Masson is and the federated uh, t 
the, the federation aspects, it's also going to embrace APIs and stuff it makes sense that it would. And that that's one of the things that like is also been kind of cool for me to see is how clean and simple it is to use that stuff in Mastodon and in Twitter for business reasons has had to just clamp down on that continuously over time. And I think it's just going to get worse. Um, it's really encouraging to see that aspect get um, brought back to like, uh, I think we're, I saw like we were talking about that and it was um I, I said it's like it's like web 2.0 again <laughs> in some ways for me anyway. The um Chris, I feel like this is your moment. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that you've been talking about for 10 years, you know, is possible. Well, pieces of it are. I there are things about Mastodon and what they're doing and how it's built that make webby stuff incredibly hard. So all of the specs that Mastodon and most of the Fediverse are built on are 15 plus years old. They're really crufty. They're not minimal examples of what you need to do to communicate on the web which makes it very hard. If you're a developer starting from scratch, there you have a humongous amount of reading to do. You can't just take a little bit of HTML, a little bit of CSS, and maybe a sprinkling of JavaScript. You, you have to go do some super heavy lifting to build activity pub or activity streams type of infrastructure, which is major pain. And there's a reason not a lot of people are doing it. I suspect a few more will get into it. But when Matt Mullenweg says, we're going to do this for Tumblr, my expectation that that actually happens is maybe 5% right now. I really think a year from now, we'll be sitting and looking at Tumblr, and Tumblr is still going to be Tumblr exactly as it is today, and it won't. it's not going to move an inch. The other kind of underlying issue is what happens when Google next week decides we're, we're all in on activity pub. We're going to do this Fediverse all the way suddenly. And what's un, unwritten in a lot of this is Mastodon is such a huge player in this space that a lot of the standards that run the Fediverse are standards because Mastodon says they are right now. If they change tomorrow and use something else, if you don't follow them, you're stuck. So if you're pixel fed or bookworm, which is kind of a version for, you know, it's a good reads replacement that runs on activity pub. If you're one of those other players, suddenly you're screwed. Or if Google or, you know, Microsoft get into it, or Amazon, let's say, decides, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to create a thing. Those 100, 900 pound gorillas can cause some serious havoc because it's standardized, but it's not really standardized. Um, so you'll see, you know, some things like that. Now, there are some people like Darius Kazemi who are playing around with things like Hometown, which I think is super cool. And he's adding kind of other layers of security or things like, you know, local posting only. So if you have a class, you could have, or if you're a university and you want to have a university or departmental wide account, you can set up local only posting with that. So there's only internal communication. And unless you screenshot it or copy paste it, it won't get out. So you can kind of create some semblance of privacy for students, although maybe not full FERPA, you know, yet um, doing that on the web is incredibly hard, obviously, but um, you could get at least a reasonable amount of here's a small private conversation. But if you want to have larger conversations with the rest of the world, you can change one setting when you make your post and that's possible. Um, can, can I ask you, Chris, but there's, you know, there's still a huge number of issues that, you know, and nobody, I, I, nobody's talking about the issues that still exist. It's, Hey, we're happy that we're not in the toxic cesspool of Twitter, but 
Can can I ask you something, Chris? I don't know if you can hear me. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I'd be super interested to know, like, the hometown fork of Mastodon. I've been following that because I think that's where Hum Commons is 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 running or H Commons. What was the logic behind that? Because I think there were certain things that Mastodon wouldn't do it. So is that a place to start looking at some of those differences and different, like, because, you know, WordPress was a fork of, like, B-Press or whatever it was early yeah. on. Like, are we looking at that moment where we're going to start seeing the kind of Fediverse as people maybe move away from some of the centralized stuff, start to fork into different options? There, I think Kathleen and her group's choice to do hometown, and I'm, honestly, I'm kind of surprised they knew it existed as a thing, but the two things they... The one thing they really wanted was to be able to change a setting to go over 500 word, the 500 character limit. So if you look at the internals of their system and there's a URL you can ping and it'll return what their system looks like. And I think their cap is a thousand words, which is meant to create more conversation and kind of longer form posts. And if you follow people on there who are posting over 500 characters, they just get a little read more thing that you click on and go to the thing. Um, and then the other thing they wanted was that local only posting as a kind of an additional layer of kind of privacy and protection so that you don't have all of the reply guy, you know, craziness. And if you want to have a smaller local conversation, uh, Darius uses it for himself because he's running. I think he lifted his cap. He had it capped at 500 people. And I think it's now at a thousand because he's added more friends who've joined in the last two months. Um, but he's doing it as a, this is kind of for me and friends and family and not really so much for the rest of the world. And I think a lot of the conversations that are on his instance are local only and, and nowhere else. It's his friends and his family and him. But if you and want the option to have just one like, instance and be able to talk to everyone else, that's there. Did they do similar modifications? Like Truth Social is a unfederated Mastodon instance, right? Well, it's a federated Mastodon instance. I think the broader Fediverse has chosen to block it specifically um but they also got into trouble too because they didn't brand it as they didn't follow any of the licensing and got into some trouble as a result but it, yeah, the it will be interesting yeah. to see people play those experiments but right now everybody thinks the fediverse is mastodon and mastodon only and they don't think about pixel fed or there's a bunch of blogging you know there's a blogging platform called write.as which is kind of a long form blogging platform built on activity pub and you can follow people's blogs through mastodon on there you'll always get that read more thing um but i don't i don't see and this apparently hubzilla will do it but i don't see any platform that supports all of activity pub that allows you to do long form stuff short posts video photos the whole nobody's it's been six years now and no one has built a a thing that does all of the things and in part it's because of that issue of the standards not quite meeting so you have to hit the standards mastodon's doing but you also have to hit the standards that every other tiny little piece of the fediverse is operating on and it's not it's not an inconsequential problem. Like the different versions of RSS back in the day, Adam, RSS2, RSS1, like when is the spec going to meet and will it bring in all? I mean, obviously it's a bigger problem in some ways, but um, it's super interesting because it does harken back yeah. to some of that. Can I ask a very kind of like functional question? So just to wrap my head around, oh, please, Chris. It looks like you want to speak. I don't want to stand in your way. Oh, no. I don't know what happened. I, okay. I hit a button and I'm good. Okay. Well, we will always let you speak. So let me ask you this quickly. So I'm, I 
did during this meeting, because this was an active meeting and I actively engaged and I actively did something. So one of the things, so thank you, community. This activity pub is saying that my people can follow the username and let me put it up here. It's just going to be the username I associate with my blog. Like here's an interesting connection issue. Maybe that links back to our conversation. So my blog is now using activity pub another node. And that would be a username people would follow to see blog posts. Or would yeah. I just link that with my Mastodon account? Like, how does that link happen, if that makes any sense? So what it's doing is it is making, it is using the standards that WordPress is built on in the forms and fields that are common to everyone. And it is making your website look like it supports the ActivityPub protocol. It's, but it's only doing about half of that. So it's using... And if you have multiple accounts on there, those multiple accounts are then followable or fi potentially findable. Gotcha. So if your username for your WordPress instance is admin, then that's going to be the thing it uses. If you go into your user profile settings and change your profile name, that suddenly will switch and should propagate um, thereafter. But what it's doing is it's looking at a bunch of the common things, your username, your profile, if you have a profile picture set up somehow. Um, and it's, it's, it's able to, that plugin is able to find those bits of data in your where you would commonly hold them or keep them in user profiles on your WordPress site. And it's able to then broadcast them to the Fediverse in a way that makes your website look like it's a standalone instance, but it's only the publishing part. So when you publish, others are able to subscribe to you from other, and not even just Mastodon, but if you, there are other interfaces that do that, let's say pixel fed or bookworm, I could subscribe to you in those places as well and see this, what you're missing with this, what's not built in yet and may ne I may never be is the reader interface. So a lot of what people love about Mastodon is you've got a, a Twitter like or a tweet deck like interface, depending on whether you set that setting for the adv advanced setting to be able to read what others are posting. And that is not built into this WordPress PC yet. I don't know that they ever will because that's another huge, that's a massive lift of following the specs. And then you've got to now store all that data from everywhere else for all the things you're following in your database somewhere, which is, you know, maybe a heavy lift thing for especially a shared hosted account to, to pull off unless you're going to only pull in four or five days worth of data and then dump it automatically as you go. Um, so I've been using uh, feed readers or social readers to follow people and then I can read them and react and respond to them with all the rest of my infrastructure. But essentially that's what that activity pub plugin is doing. And then the web finger piece, the web finger plugin is actually essentially putting a, um, a JSON file into your well-known dot well-known pat root path, which a lot of old school web stuff uses to identify who you are, your account, your name, you know, where you can be found on the web. So essentially you can, the way Unix used to finger email addresses, you can finger web addresses, thus the name web finger. Um, so that adds that kind of identity piece for that. And then there's another one called um, the node one, you point node to. info two, which, and none of it's documented. I'm starting to scribble up some documentation for pieces of it. Um, the all, almost all of it was written by uh, Matthias Feffela, uh, who is a longtime WordPress engineer. He works for one and one in Germany and has been doing this stuff in his free time. 
Um, but he's he's built and written big chunks of most of the indie web infrastructure as well. So when new stuff comes out, he's like, okay, I'm just going to support it and start writing code. So this stuff has been around for a couple of years. And the last time I looked about two weeks ago, there were over 800 WordPress sites that were using it and actively kind of playing around in the space. So my guess is as more and more people do it, they'll find the handful of bugs and squash them and it'll be much better, at least for the publishing side. Um, somebody's going to have to do some heavy work to decide we're going to support this on the consumer side. But I think it's probably solid enough that with a few tweaks, if WordPress.com wanted to put it into core or flip, flip the switch next week, they could do that. And suddenly most of the web would suddenly support this or a big chunk of this spec. So I have a, what I think is a related question. I, I, I mentioned that I'm still just sort of learning the ropes on this, but I am curious about the profile metadata area of the Mastodon uh, profile. And particularly because, as Taylor mentioned earlier, um, spoofing another account is, in a federated, you know, situation is, is a rather easy thing to do. And looking at the verification area of, a Mastodon profile or using it in a similar way to those um, directory files for, for well-known as sort of like the place that points out to the other, um, other things that you're doing um, in your sort of digital identity. Has anybody looked into that um, much or, or set that up? And what are you choosing as the verification point to add that tag uh, for Mastodon to get the sort of green verification area on, in your profile. And and the nice thing about that is that is just using the rel link. Um, and you can do that with basically anything that gives you control over the HTML. Um, so like I, my blog is a static site. <laughs> so I just made a link there, but um, you can do it in WordPress. You can do it in pretty much anything. Um, and that is pretty easy to do and lightweight. Um, you know, I threw like, mine in my WP content directory, um, oh. but I was just curious where other folks m thought and if there is a good practice for this, if there's some place better than others to sort of do it's that. Like Since I'm not afraid of Gutenberg, I just did it right. <laughs> the curse of Gutenberg. I, uh, I, I think the, what I typically see is people will uh, put it on the homepage somewhere um, and, um, like in my site, I have like a little, like I blog on this site, I post on Mastodon, I do this, I do this. And the link for post on Mastodon is that link. So not only does that link link back to my Mastodon, but it's also got the rel, uh, stuff in it to, so that I can the, have Mastodon. Get the general it. setup for what it's doing is the only way you can have it, the rel me points from one web page to another to say, essentially, here's another version of me on the web. And they used to do it, I, I think Twitter took it out about two years ago, but Twitter had built in rel me so that if you put your website name into their, here's my website field in your account, it automatically created a rel me link to your website. And then your website, because you control it and can put that Realme link on it, can point back. And the fact that the two things that you have, you have to log in and be able to set those settings to make them point at each other becomes the indicator that, yes, in fact, I do own this thing. So it becomes a um, kind of a an independent way of verifying one website to another. The common ways I've seen people do it. So a lot of people on their sidebar will have, you know, here's my Facebook account, my Instagram account, my Twitter account, my Mastodon account. And those links, when you click on them, go to those places. So a lot of people have been putting that Realme link onto those is a quick, easy way to do it. If you're using the old, um, uh, the old WordPress interface, the classic version there, and it may have even started out as a jetpack thing, but I think it's now in everything. 
there's a thing you can create essentially a menu of all those social things. And there's a, a custom button in there you can click that says add classes. And if you just type the word me into that field, you'll get that ability. But a lot of people are just throwing in either a, a link in a sidebar or a widget. They're putting it in their footer. Um, you could throw it anywhere on your page. Another, if you, I don't encourage it because it becomes hidden metadata that you forget is there. Um, but you can use, instead of an anchor link, you can use a, a link. So a bracket link href equals your URL on Mastodon and then add a class of rail equals me and that'll do it. And that'll create a hidden link that will verify you. But again, you know, you may forget that hidden link is there five years from now. And, you know, it, that's that interesting. Makes... What you're saying, Chris, made me go back and say, and Tim, like, I was like, where did I add it? And I added it to my <laughs> blog roll, like as a kind of hidden link, but still a realm me. So like, I'm one of those weird people who still have a blog roll and Baba Social is in there as a link which gave me the the check mark i haven't figured out how to do it in in uh peer tube yet but it is a it is an exercise where it can take longer i know martha burtis was like it's not it's not working and it sometimes you have to redo it uh, chris i think you were part of that conversation like it does take a while yeah the the indie web plugin the main thing that is kind of a it's a clearinghouse to say, here's a bunch of other plugins that do other stuff, but the actual functionality that it provides is to give you an H card, which kind of is, you know, a business card online that's, that tells other computers, here's my name, here's my profile picture, here's other places you can find me. So that what that plugin does is it adds a few additional fields to your user profile including one at the bottom that says, you know, other, other profiles in other places. I think WordPress has Twitter and Facebook and a few other common ones built in, but it adds some additional ones for Mastodon or other accounts. So you can literally go in and I think it's a, it's, I don't think it's comma separated, but it's all, each line is an account and I have a, so if I have four different Mastodon locations i can just put the url to each of those identities in that box and that'll automatically do it um in fact i think in that box i have a couple hundred social media account sites that do that um and i my favorite thing for doing this is there's a social podcast bookmark service called huffduffer.com that I use to bookmark audio. And what it does is when I'm on a page, I can't listen to this NPR story right now. So I bookmark it with Huff Duffer and Huff Duffer scrapes the page, finds the MP3 file and creates essentially a custom podcast feed for what I want to listen to. So I subscribe to it, my podcatcher, and I get it all. The fun thing that Surface does is when you give it your identity, your URL where you live online, it looks at your website and scrapes all the Realme instances that it finds. And then it shows your kind of social, other socials in a list on its website. You don't have to, when you register, type your 50 other accounts in there, which is annoying and it's what happens on every social media site. But this one uses those web standards to find all the places you've already said you're a member of or part of or where you live in other places. And it just lists them for you automatically. Um, and the, for me, that is, you know, just a super silly, simple thing that every social media service on the planet ought to do that because it's annoying. You join something new and then suddenly you have to... I'll give you a URL so you can look at the example and you'll see how many rail me links I have on my and site. When, when Chris was talking, what I, when he was saying like that H card, I, I just used the Gutenberg editor to create 
a kind of manual H card because it just needs a div that's got a class H card on it. I put, I had my name on my website already. I had my job title on my website already. I had links to my social media accounts already. And so all I had to do was kind of just link those together. Yeah, I think, I, I think that makes um, a lot more sense. Sorry, Jim. No, no, Tim. I was just not going to say anything important at all. And the the H card for for like strictly for your question, Tim, like you don't have to use H card to do like the Mastodon green link thing, but H card is sort of the bigger. It'd be cooler. Kind of cooler. Well, it would be cool, but I think it would also make it a lot more difficult for for folks to to properly implement that. Right. Because now it's like a, I got to redesign parts of my page uh, project. And it, would it be good to do that for them? Potentially. Um, but, you know, like for instance, I have Realme links on my site. I don't have an H card. I should do one. I've always wanted to do one. I literally have a little to do list that I've had for years of like things I want my website to support from an indie web perspective that it just doesn't. Um, and H card is probably the first thing I should do because it wouldn't take that long. Uh, but, you know, those things are all part of sort of an ecosystem of this stuff, right? So. I was going to say one of the things that I am excited about right now. And Tim, I came just a little like anecdote. Like I had no intention of doing Mastodon. I was like, I'm done kind of with Twitter. It's just like on life support. And I don't need another Twitter. And then Alan was like, DS106, like we don't, we need a Mastodon account or server because we can't do it on these other servers. No one was. And so I was like, you know, he's asking, I'll try. I installed it. And then I got to the interface and I was like, oh, this isn't bad. And then I was like, oh, I'm only following like 40 people. And I'm posting pictures that I would have posted on Twitter or stuff like that. That's not, it's like, I like the, how would you say, quotidian nature of some of that social media, like the DS106 radio. Like that's where I, and, and this has kind of been that. And add to it the cool thing of like bridging together all these weird RSS <laughs> technologies to make it work. And, you know, I didn't have the headspace for it before, but now that I saw that other people are there, which is always the draw for me and not everyone, which is kind of the drawback of Twitter, I got excited again. And who knows if it will last. It's, I don't have the same investment because it's always the blog first, but I, I like being around other cool people thinking this stuff through and there's a very low overhead to doing it. It's not like you have to post or it's not about attention. And even the people are like, I remember some of the Mastodoners have been doing it for a while. Like when all the Twitter people started coming in, they're like, they're ruining the party. Like they're all so loud. They all keep posting. It was very emo. The thunder I and do think problem. I do think for folks that even, you know, uh, even, even when you're, practicing what you what you preach and you know publishing the important the good the fun stuff to the blog first that you own and control i do think it's natural and makes sense for some people lots of people to have a need or want for a different um maybe lower impact space like people create digital identities and think about them and in, in limitless ways right and what i think of when i think when i post a mastodon is it's sort of low effort it isn't super representative of me as a professional all the time sometimes it is like it's very different my website is that's the stuff i care about mostly goes there i'm not gonna say all of it is important and i care a lot about but you know what i mean like i view those things as different and i have a reason for them to be it, both in my life anyway for them both to exist and for them to not really be the same thing like i don't i definitely don't want all my mastodon posts on my blog and i i guess most of my blog posts could go on mastodon but you know I, they're they're different things for me you uh, the other thing people have done is you can create a kind of a separate space on your website that is not centered for all that chit chat stuff so I know a bunch of people who they post all their Mastodon stuff on their site, 
but they have it hidden as kind of a little micro blog thing off to the side. And if you're subscribed sure. to their main RFS feed, they hide it all. So you don't see all the, the noise. So, uh, you know, I've got, actually I had to do some heavy WordPress work this past year because my data, my WordPress database went over, um, was it two gigabytes of text data? Not even photos, but just pure text over two gigs of data. And it's because I have for the last like eight or nine years owned everything I post online on my website. Um, so, you know, I've got, I think it's over like 50,000 plus posts on my site, like pieces of content. That's awesome. Um, and only by maybe a third of it is even public. Um, wow. But if I'm searching for something, I can go to one place and search and find it. And to me, that is just, that saves half of my world. I don't have to think, oh, did I put that on Mastodon or Twitter or Facebook and then try and search for it there. I just, I have it. Yeah. Um, the fa I mean, the two, search on a lot of those tools is crazy. Like two gig going is, back to that. Two gig is a lot. I've, uh, I will just say we, we support some WordPress multi-sites here and a lot of the ones that I don't don't even approach that. Some of them are bigger, but um, that's a lot of text. <laughs> yeah, well, I, when I went to one and one I was like, you know, I need a bigger database. Can you help me out? And they're like, well, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I have this WordPress site. And they're like, you know, what kind of multi-site thing is it? We can move you up like five tiers. And I'm like, no, it's just a small personal blog. <laughs> and I really, I don't want to pay 500 bucks a month to do this. I just want to. Yeah, they were probably like, uh, not a, nope, not a small personal blog by our <laughs> definition. Um, yeah. But yeah, they're probably wondering what was wrong, right? They're probably like, there's something creating crazy entries and this guy doesn't yeah. even know that it's happening, you know? Yeah, That's no, that was the first thought. thing. And I was, I was like, you know, I've looked at it and it's all just... It's fine, yeah. You know. <laughs> That's when you reach, whipped out your indie web bab and you're like, do you know, sir, that I created the indie web? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't come close to creating it, but I do some crazy stuff. Um, it's fun. Well, I agree with Ed Beck. Your day has come, Chris, and I appreciate you not only joining us, but like you've been wonderful presence all over. I've seen you talking with Kathleen and other people who are getting into it. So as usual, you know, you're walking the walk and talking the talk. It's awesome. So thanks. Yeah, I appreciate you coming in here and sharing us. I'm I'm activity pub now. Um, thanks to you. <laughs> um, I, I interestingly too, I had a. I had dinner last night with a friend who is a project manager at, um, uh, I'm going to, I always forget the name of, he, he works for a, essentially a company that doles out massive grant money, uh, primarily in sciences and sometimes in the humanities. Um, and he had actually seen Kathleen in DC at some conference yesterday and then he's out here for a group. Um, and essentially they have created a, a small high-end group of funders who dole out massive multiple millions of dollars to the sciences. And they help high wealth individuals figure out how to donate money. So when Zuckerberg and Chan decided we wanna give money away to science, how do we do that? How do we build the infrastructure? They went to this group of people. Um, but he said to me, he's like, I really want, and he's describing to me essentially a domain of one's own or indie web as a thing. And he knows I kind of dabble in it. Um, but he's like, I, I want to help fund groups. I need either. He's like, I can't write checks to individuals, but you know, I can write hundreds of thousands of dollars of checks to millions to groups who want to, you know, play around in open spaces or do open. And he, in particular, he's interested in open science and how university labs can have better kind of website infrastructure on the web, both for themselves as well as for internal and external communications. I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll tip some friends off that you're doing that because I think you got what you guys are doing 
or you could even pull in somebody like um, you know Cog Dog or the broader network. And as long as he's got an institution that he can write a check to to pay for it, he would like to fund, or they would like to fund, you know, open open science initiatives that relate to you know open source and open web and domain of one's own in, a, in some sense. Uh, I don't know how we. I don't know if they would or wouldn't balk at um, for be, profits. But it'd be interesting. Works, but. Like it would be interesting. Like if there was a group, and you link that to a sciences and whatever institutions, variety of them, like bring people to the table. But like a consortium, where part of what they're doing is working on some of these open protocols you were talking about, and making some of that stuff work and getting people interested in it. Like, I'd be super, oh, Sloan, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, that's like, like these, they got money. Like, yeah. And, I mean, and even more, he knows like the five or 10 other people in those other spaces who yeah. have pockets. So when, if they pass for some reason, he's got other places to. Well, let's, uh, I would, I mean, if you're going to reach out to folks, let us know. I'd be very interested in seeing where that goes. I mean, we're not science-based, we're for profit. I think it'd probably be better living in the higher ed stuff. But like, obviously, I think if you can fund and get people excited, you can get these pockets like the indie web folks and stuff doing yeah. amazing things. That's what's exciting around all, seeing all these people get in there and starting to say, oh, we could do this. Oh, look at this. These two mm -hmm. can connect. And yeah. it's just it's awesome. The problem he's seeing and that he's got is most of the people who want to work on these types of things or these types of problems, a lot of them are in academia or they're people who work for big corporations and have full-time day jobs that don't allow them that fungibility of other outside work. So you almost need somebody who's got a solid enough consulting business that they can kind of leave off a piece of it and go work on some separately funded project or somebody in academia who has some free time to. And Alan, Alan would immediately come to mind for yeah. sure. He was one of the first, I was like, okay, there's that. But I think this kind of network of people yeah, who, I can... who we are and what we want is the same thing that he wants. He just, he has bagfuls of money that he can put in be... our lap. Interesting to look at like what CUNY did with Open Lab too. Yes. Right. Exactly. And see like, is there an institution that feels particularly strongly that they can hire folks and they need funding to do all that work? You know? Um, he's mentioned to me too as an example the one of the first things that he funded in 2011 was um, the libraries or library carpentry. And it was John Udell told him about uh, somebody he ought to meet to build this thing. Um, so it's that kind of, they prefer to do it with small groups who have some infrastructure and who need funding to get things moving. Mm -hmm. But to have created something like the, you know, library carpentries as a project that then spins out and runs for years or, um, I'm trying to think of another and he started out at George Mason and got his PhD there and was one of the guys who worked on Zotero. So oh, those are the his name? Of, uh, Josh Greenberg. Okay. So yeah. I remember the Zotero crew. Yeah. Huh. Um, so he, I think he went to the New York public library and did digital for them for a couple of years and then went to Sloan and he's been there for more than a decade, I think. Um, I think it's, look, it's, it's good. I mean, obviously Kathleen Fitzpatrick and the work they're doing at MSU is, is amazing. I love that they pushed on this, but I, if you need ideas for people, I'll send them like people who I know. There's a yeah. guy who does amazing. You probably know Boone gorgeous. Mm -hmm. He's another one who's a developer who would be like someone who can get some of that stuff. The thing is, is I've always been kind of aligned more with the humanities so I yeah. don't know some of the social science, the, the sciences so well. I work with some pieces, but like I'm, I'm well, I, the, limited there. The, the, the problems are all the same. He's just viewing it more from a science perspective yeah. than others might. Um, 
And I, in fact, I told him, I was like, you should go tell Kathleen to put in for some money because they're doing yeah. what you're talking about within the humanities already. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's, it's the same problem. It's just what sub problems are you working on after that? So it's interesting. A lot of this stuff, I think um, that I feel like talking with um, like in higher ed, talking with faculty, folks involved in humanities get the ownership stuff right away or not right away, but in a lot of cases right away um, in ways that um, it makes sense because of what they study and they, they think a lot about um, authorship and, and that kind of thing. Um, and to kind of have something that can maybe bring some of that cool work that's into this the more uh, like the STEM community is really probably worthwhile, but um, all right. I think we probably should wrap we, it up. We're half an hour over. <laughs> so, um, but it was, it was a uh, great talking with everyone who's here. Um, and uh, thanks for everyone who oh, stopped. But in. before you jump though, you got to do like a half a second of PR for tomorrow. Is that oh, you're just going to sit down and actually build a thing? And oh, for, it up? for tomorrow. Well, we got a couple things going on tomorrow. So uh, the press books thing I'm in particular, I was interested yeah, in. Yeah. So, so, uh, a couple things. Um, one thing I, I was going to mention today that I didn't mention at all is we have a Mastodon installer on Reclaim Cloud as of today. So that that just came out. So <laughs> um, All this and you forgot that part? Well, I mean... There is the lead. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll announce it, but it's a one-click installer. Um, and uh, and we're, the reason I don't, I don't want to... I did bury the lead is it's not documented yet. So, you know, folks will have to use it and then they have to go edit a config file to set up mail and stuff like that. I mean, it does tell them this, but we don't have a nice document for it yet, yeah. but that's a thing. Um, and then uh, tomorrow we got two things. So we have an open media ecosystem flex course. It's currently in its second week. We're going to be talking about Jitsi, which is the tool we're talking on right now, actually, um, and setting it up and showing what that's like. That's happening at what time does that air that happens at 11 a.m eastern um and then at 1 eastern um amanda and i are going to be messing around with press books this is actually a follow-up we we set up press books in reclaim cloud um just the bare bones like we set up wordpress change the version it's running change the php version got the multi-site set up and then the plugins for press books now we're going to be dealing with the dependencies because Pressbooks has dependencies yeah. that you need to install on the server to do PDFs and uh, in EPUB validation and XML import, things like that. Some of it we know that will work. Some of it we haven't tried yet. So it's going to be a little bit freewheeling and we may not completely get all of it working to be perfectly honest. And that's, that's okay. Is that, and that's moving towards a one-click install as well? We'll see. It would be great to have a one-click install. The tricky thing with Pressbooks is they, they don't, currently have documented super well what versions of all the things you need so like they don't actually have on their website like what version of wordpress they support they have it uh they say the most recent version of wordpress usually is what they say <laughs> um yeah. so it's a little tricky for me because i'm like i can't build an installer to that <laughs> you know um but I would say, I think there's a world where we could get it documented well enough that maybe it's not a one-click installer but it's it's a hey click this button you'll get wordpress now run these six commands and you can literally copy paste them and you know now you've got press books i think that's possible um so that's what we're going to see tomorrow is uh, how how uh much of that dependencies we can get set up going so yeah that's for me i i really want it and the cost of having press books or paying someone else to do it for me as an individual is higher than I want it to be. And it's sadly, it's not just a quick shared hosting. Yeah. Simple thing. And I, I really wish it were because if it were, I would have it tomorrow without the 8 million dependencies. I just don't have the, the admin tax time to spend on doing it as a thing. Yeah. And I think, I think the cloud can be a pretty decent middle ground, right? Because you can host it in, in our cloud and it wouldn't be, and you know, it's not going to be as cheap as shared hosting, just not a yeah. thing. That's the great thing about shared hosting is how cheap it can be. But it also isn't, you're not paying hundred dollars a month either. You're probably talking between 10 and 20 bucks a month, 
which is not nothing, but uh, certainly cheaper. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and you know, because you can get all those dependencies can work. Like I said, some of them are a little tricky because like we're, we're kind of, I'm kind of fighting with Pressbooks' documentation at this point because some of it needs updating a lot. Um, but it's possible to get it working because you have access to, you know, install stuff on that environment yeah. in the way you can't with shared. So I think it's a pretty good middle ground for it. And yeah, hopefully we can, we're using the streams to kind of document our process and then hopefully circle back on it and say, here are our recommendations and here's what you do so that people don't have to watch three hours of me fumbling with it. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and that's, that's always fine too. Or if they watch you fumble with it, they may be able to, you know, help you kind of rubber duck debug it in some sense. Um, well, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that if someone is interested, they can kind of see our process and, and kind of maybe learn something if they want to, you know, that this is, there's dual purpose for us, you know, um, they, they can learn something about how the cloud works and ticks, even if we're not completely successful tomorrow, that we'll certainly get some of it working. So, okay. all right. I think, uh, oh, I think that's time. What your, oh. um, your, uh, your Mastodon one click. I'm, I, I, Probably I'll want to play around with it over the holidays, so I'm glad it exists before the holidays hit. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm curious what, if you were doing a small single user instance, what is the cost of that on a per month? And I don't um, know if you've done a beat of like our small DS106 cost post yet. Yeah, so, so that, that is... I can give some basic recommendations, but I'm not even going to give a dollar amount because there's a couple things there. So... The media, um, the the storage needs for media is not insignificant. So for a single yeah. user, you could do it all in Reclaim Cloud. But if you're doing any more than a single user, you'd probably want to set up S3 for storage. Jim has a blog post on setting that up. My installer will make that pretty easy from the Mastodon end to do. Um, but uh, you would want to do that. And then you're dealing with whatever cost that is. And the reason that's so significant is not just your post, but when it pulls in, your timeline it has a cache all that right um so that's one thing now mastodon itself though if you're doing a single user and is lo relatively low traffic i'm seeing between eight and 12 cloudlets which if you go into reclaim cloud and just use its little interface eight cloudlets is like 20 bucks a month so it's it's yeah. you know not again it's not shared hosting right so yeah, yeah. um but it is kind of a significant application just at idle just because it, it does a lot of i think it's i think it has a lot to do with the um activity pub um and and uh it's got a service called sidekick that does all of the asynchronous yeah, yeah. stuff and that thing will just use whatever ram <laughs> well, it wants that's, yeah that's the problem or things like um Mastodon dot technology shut down last week and they're oh. still sending out delete notices. They're trying to be responsible, but like they're sending out millions and millions of notices all across the Fediverse for this knucklehead thing that most instances don't care about and they would just drop the data. Well, and that's the tricky thing, right? Is Mastodon is just like this is what we've been talking about. Like it's cool, but it's not. It's not small. It just isn't. Yeah. Like it's not designed from a technology perspective to be that way. And so my one click installer, like you could use it for a single person, but I don't know that most people will want to. I think I'm putting it out there so people can play with it, yeah. see what it's like to admin, and then maybe they want to run a small instance. And I think that could make some sense because the thing is, it scales in that small to medium instance size pretty well. Like I would be willing to bet that, I, I mean, I could look, but I don't want to mess with it right now, but the DS106 instance, which only has like 50-ish people on it, probably doesn't cost much more than a one person instance at the moment, <laughs> right? Because yeah. most of the time it's just idle and handling in, it's, it, most of the time it's just, it's just listening yeah. for people's timelines, basically. I think most of the handful of hosts that do that or have been doing that have locked themselves down for the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. And they're, they've got a queue and they're letting people in slowly, but so many people want to run and host their own stuff. They've all shut down. So I would recommend you don't broadcast it widely or you may be inundated with so many people that you may actually have trouble scaling it yourselves. But I also know there's people like Anil Dash who wants to or is willing to tinker and wants his own instance, but he knows it's also going to be, 
if he joins a public instance, he may bring it down instantaneously just because he's as big a name as he is in that space. I think I'm following. He's on what some instance? I'm pretty sure I'm following. Yeah, him he's on he's, a, right now. he's on one mastodon.cloud, I think. Okay, but that's they, a pretty big one. They've been doing some hinky things, and he mm. wants to leave it because some instances are starting to defederate them for choices that they have made. Gotcha. And so he he's going to go somewhere, mm -hmm. and either he wants to go somewhere that's big enough that they can handle it, or he can tell them in advance and say, "Here's here's a couple hundred bucks to like defray the cost, but be but be ready for the infrastructure when I join because it's going to be a massive." You know, it'll take your servers down kind of day. Sure. Uh, or where can I go that I can set up my own and just do it? Although he doesn't want the admin tax of doing it. He wants. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and that's the important distinction that I want to make, too, when we document this installer is like, look, this doesn't get you out of sysadmin. It gets you out of the eight hours of getting it set up sysadmin, you, yeah. it will be working. And then from there, you still got to pay attention when upgrades happen and you have to know to run this command to do upgrades. Now it's it's all in Docker. So like, yeah. it's not actually that hard to manage upgrades, but it's yeah. not nothing, you know? You, you've got work to do, I'll let you go. <laughs> all right. Well, well, I may see you tomorrow for press books. Cool, sounds good. Thanks, David.